At the end of the last lecture, I did a little whole bunch of hand waving to talk about uh, conversion to local coordinate space, um, which uh, was obviously very hard to follow. I didn't, when you're doing this, it, it didn't have anything to draw with. So I've, um, I've written some notes um, on that, and we'll just go through that to, to, uh, to clarify what I was talking about. So we're familiar with the idea of every object having um, being somewhere in the world coordinate space, but also having its own local coordinate space for when you move it. So we, we already know that translate and rotate work within the local coordinate space rather than within the, the world coordinate space. Um, and we also know that objects can have children objects that are attached to it and move when it moves. Those objects uh, exist within the local coordinate space of their parent. So the, if you look at the transform on, a, um, on, a, on an object that's a child of another object, um, the coordinates in the transform for the object are, are its coordinates within its parent's space. Um, so if I, in fact, if I can show you that in an example, um, here's a simple example. The, uh, the ball is attached, is a child of the paddle in the breakout game. Uh, the ball's coordinate, if we, so the, the paddle's coordinate is in, is in world space because the paddle exists in the world. It's at the highest level of the hierarchy. The ball is within the paddle space. So if we select the ball, the ball's coordinate is 0, 1.160. Uh, so it's, it's uh, so zero, if it was 0, 0, 0, oh, you can't see the paddle. The paddle's right there. So if the ball's coordinate was 0, 0, 0, it would be exactly on top of the paddle. But as it is, it's one unit up in the, in the paddle's coordinate space. Now, where that, that pl places it within the world's coordinate space, um, where you have to do a bit of math to work that out. But um, so when you have objects that are children, their coordinates are generally in the local coordinate space of their parent. Uh, let's go back to what we're talking about. So, and the, uh, that local coordinate space can be rotated, trans translated and stretched, uh, scaled. Um, with, res with regard to the, uh, the world space. So if we take a world space that looks like that and put a parent object in that world and then a child object which is attached to that parent, then that child exists within the local, spe the local space of the parent. And zero, zero in that local space is whatever position the, uh, is the position of the parent object and this child ha might have position, you know, whatever, whatever its position is within that space. If we translate the, uh, the parent object, the child moves with it, and the child stays at the same point in the local space, but moves within the world space. If we, again, if we rotate the parent space, um, the child moves with it and, um, and, and moves within the world space, but it still has the same coordinates in the local space. And if we scale the, uh, the parent, we actually scale the space as well, and we scale all the objects within it, which I hadn't thought about, which I just realized this morning that there's a bug in the breakout code, because I wasn't thinking about scaling the space. Um, so when we scale the coordinate space, uh, if we double the, the x scale of the space, we double the distance from, um, from here to here, uh, the x distance from there to there. And, we, and if we stretch the y, then we stretch the y distance as well. So we double the distance in the world space, but the coordinate of this object is still exactly the same in the, uh, in the local space. Notice we also scale the child. So if we scale the parent, the child gets stretched as well. So if you, um, if you stretch the parent in one direction, all its children also get stretched out in that, in that direction. Um, the transform class provides to a bunch of methods for transforming between lo world and local spaces. Um, so if I have an object with a transform on it, which every game object does, then, um, then I can take any local point within, that, um, within the local space of that transform and convert it into a world point using the transform point function. Um, and I can do the opposite by using the inverse transform point uh, function. So um, it's a really, uh, it's, I find it difficult to remember which one's forwards and which one's backwards, which one's inverse. I wish they'd named it something more sensible, like world to local and local to world, but that's the names they are. So um, I don't expect you to remember these things in, in the exam. I always look up in the API. In the exam, you will be given a booklet of the APIs of all the classes you'll be using, including this one. 
Um, the other thing we want to transform is we often want to transform direction vectors. Um, now the difference between transforming a point and transporting a, transforming a, a direction is if we translate the space, all points, all points within the space are also translated. But a vector within that space should, should still have the same length. So if we, uh, if we transform a point, uh, see now I'm waving my hands around again. If we transform a point, uh, the trans, if we, sorry, if we translate a space, then any point gets that, that translation added to it when we transform it. But if we translate a vector, um, then, then we don't need to change it. It's, the, the vector has the same length, it's just moved to a different place in the space. So these, if you actually, if the thing you're, you're working with is a direction and not a point, then you need to use transform di direction rather than transform point. Um, that's the basic idea. Um, so getting onto what I was trying to do at the end of last lecture, we had, I wanted to deal with the problem of bricks being trans, bricks being rotated in space. If it's for me, tell them I'm in a lecture and I can't answer right now. Because, you know, it'd be really rude to, to answer a phone in the middle of a lecture. Um, sorry. Uh, so we want to collide with this brick, but this brick is on an angle and the code that we wrote before only handled bricks that were, that were horizontal. Um, and so we need to work out, there's the direction before we collide, and there's the direction after we collide, but well, what's that new direction going to be? Now, computing that in the world space would be really awful and would regard, would involve a whole bunch of trigonometry, which we don't want to do. Um, but computing it in the, in the uh, local space of the brick is actually much easier. So if we consider the local coordinates of the brick, um, and if we convert both the position of the, of the ball and this, and this input vector that we have into those local coordinates, then it's much easier to do it. So those local coordinates, we just have to... Um, so if we rotate it and, and the brick is stretched, because a brick, a cube, is normally one by one, so in its, and its mind, in its mind, in its local space, that's still a one by one cube, but we've stretched it along the x-axis in the world space. So we need to unstretch it as well. Um, and now we have a new, um, this is the local coordinate space of, of the brick. So from the brick's point of view, this is what the world looks like. Um, now, the, uh, here, the top corner of the brick is going to be 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and the bottom corner is going to be negative 0 0.5, negative 0 0.5, um, obviously ignoring the z-axis. And, uh, and here's the ball, and the ball is underneath the brick and is in, is in between the left and right. And here's one, one source of mistake that we made in our code previously. When I was saying that the ball, checking whether the ball was underneath the brick, I asked whether it was in between, in between these two edges. And so I took this, lo this point in the local coordinate space of the, um, of the brick, and I asked whether it was between here and here. Now the numbers that I used for, for the left and right boundary were wrong. Um, they should have been a half, negative a half and positive a half. The numbers I actually used were, were local scales or something or other, and that's wrong. Um, so we need to go and fix that in the code. I noticed it wasn't colliding with the, um, the paddle in particular very, very well. When it hit the corner of the paddle, it was meant to bounce back out in the same direction, and it didn't. And um, I discovered that's because the paddle is quite stretched, and the numbers weren't working out right. So this is a very good um, example of how testing your code is very important. Um, just because we thought we'd written something right, um, and it generally worked, but we didn't test all the little corner cases in the, in the... And in this particular case, it was very much a corner case. When it hits on the corner, it wasn't doing the right thing. Um, so, so we need to, first of all, to check whether we've collided, we need to check the point position of this ball within that space. And that's nice and easy because that space is a really, um, you know, it's, once we're down in this size, it's just between, whether it's between negative a half and a half. Um, the other thing we need to do is work out if we have this input vector, what's this output vector? Um, what, if this is the direction the ball was travelling before it hit, what direction is it travelling after it hit? And now this is really easy because um, this is just a simple reflection now. Um, so if we uh, zoom in on that, um, we can see that if this is the, uh, if this is the input vector, then the output vector needs to be a, the reflection in this vertical line that goes, that goes down from the ball. Um, and so we take, 
So we transform the, uh, the direction the ball is moving from its world coordinates using tra inverse transform direction. Now this is the, the direction the ball is moving in the local coordinates of the brick. So from the brick's point of view, um, that's, the way, that's the direction that the, uh, the ball is moving. Now we, what we want to calculate, so we can break, <coughs> excuse me, we can break that down into its x and y parts. Right? The, uh, the x part is the horizontal bit and that's in red and the y part is the vertical bit and that's in green. Now what we want to compute the, uh, the direction it's moving afterwards, it should still be moving, have the same x part because bouncing doesn't affect how, how fast you're moving uh, left and right but we want to change the direction of the y part. So, so for our new vector, we, have, we keep the same x part as before, but we negate the y part. Right? This gives us the new direction the ball is moving in the local coordinates of the brick. So from the brick's point of view, this is what's happened. Now, <clears throat> now all we need to do is convert that new vector back into world coordinates. And so we transform its direct, uh, we do transform direction again, or transform direction rather than inverse this time. Take that local coordinates, and that gives us the new um, new direction for the world coordinates. So it gives you some idea of how 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 what, what I was all that hand wavy stuff that I was doing last time. Um, and the nice thing is that we managed to do that without doing any uh, any trigonometry. We didn't actually have to work out sines and cosines or anything like that. Um, the, uh, the transform and inverse transform handled that all for us neatly and all we had to do was just change the x and y coordinates around a little bit. Um, so that's what I was talking about last time. So to code that up correctly, let's go back to um, our scripts. Actually it's over here. So if we were looking at ball.move this is, I, went, I put the script back to the way it was, so, um, so we were, had the moving up and moving down. So let's go back to this, there's a direction, we're going to get rid of moving up and moving down. We're going to have a direction vector, which is a vector, th <coughs> excuse me, vector 3. Um, and we're going to, um, if I remember, Initially, that'll be set by the user, but initially we want it to be, we want to make sure it's normalized. So what we're going to do here is whatever the vector that the, um, whatever the vector that the users, give, the program has put in, in the editor, we'll normalize it to make sure it's a vector of, direct, of length one. Um, then down here, all we have to do is say, we remove this code that we had before about mo whichever, moving up and moving down, and we just, move in that direction at, the, at whatever speed that we're moving. So the direction will always be a unit, a one, a link, sorry, the direction will always be a unit vector, or that is a vector of length one, uh, pointing in whatever direction the ball is meant to be moving. The speed will then tell us how fast the ball is meant to be moving. So we take the direction vector, we scale it by the speed, and we scale it by time dot delta time because we, because we want to make sure that it scales uh, um, no matter how fast we're running. Um, now the thing that, the bug that I said we had in our code is that here when we're saying, when we're working out whether we're above a brick, we were transforming the point um, into the local coordinates of the brick. So this is the position of the ball, transform dot position. This is the, uh, the coordinate space of the brick, brick dot transform. And so we we're taking the world position of the ball and converting it into the local coordinates of the brick, and that's P. Now the problem we had here is that this is wrong. That shouldn't be, uh, this should just be whether it's greater than 0 0.5. Because the, um, the scale is automatically taken into account when we transform the point. So if the brick has been scaled in the x or y directions, um, that will automatically be accounted for when we transform it. Um, the scaling will be undone. So, um, so that's 0 0.5. This is negative 0 0.5. Oops. That's also negative 0 0.5, and that's 0 0.5, which makes our code much neater and easier to understand, um, which is good. So now what we do is where before we, we were changing moving up and moving down, all we need to do now is say, okay, 
we need to do what I, what I said before, which is um, variable v before equals, actually we'll just use v, variable v equals tra brick, oh no, not brick, it's a, a what dot transform dot um, inverse transform direction direction. So we take the, the direction the ball's currently moving and we convert it into the local coordinate space of whatever the thing is we hit, which is the brick. In fact, we might even rename that to brick. Let's call that brick. 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 See, now I shouldn't have done that because now I've got to do it everywhere. Oh, I really do have to do it everywhere. Okay, there should be a edit. Find, is there a find? Find and replace. What? What with brick? If I can spell it, brick. Next. Replace, replace. Replace, replace, and we're done. Okay, that's better. Okay, so, so now we've converted the, uh, we've taken our vector, uh, our direction, we've converted it into the local coordinate space. So now when we hit something from above, um, we change the y coordinate like I, like I just showed you. So, it's, so we just negate the y coordinate and leave the other coordinates the same. And if we hit something from below, we do the same thing. Um, and if we hit something from the left, we uh, negate the x coordinate and leave the y coordinate the same, so it's the same thing but from the other side of the brick. And if we hit something from the right, we do the same. And actually, since the body of these two, since, uh, since this is the same code as that, and this is the same code as that, um, it's generally neater in, in your program to, um, to not have reproduced code. Um, particularly if we, if we want to change those things, we'd have to do those again. So we can actually just have one if statement um, that does both, both parts by using a Boolean expression, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago. So we can say if we're below, above the brick or we're below the brick, um, then we change the direction, which is exactly, it does exactly the same thing as what we had before, but, um, but it only does the, uh, it only does, has the code there once rather than writing the code twice. Um, reducing unnecessary duplication of your code generally makes your programs easier to read and it makes them easier to, do, easier to debug because um, if, I'd, if I'd made a bug in this code, I probably would have written the same bug twice and then if I came back and fixed it, I might only fix one of them and then wonder why my code is still not working and then realize, oh, it's because I fixed the code there, but I didn't fix the code over there. And so having duplicated code is, is just generally um, a bad idea. Of course, you don't need to go to extreme lengths to, don't make your code unreadable in the process of trying to remove all duplication. But in this case, we can make our, our code still fit quite readable, um, but we, uh, we remove some of the unnecessary stuff. So we can go that. And put that back over here. So, yeah, no, the code is a little bit neater. All right, so we've, we've changed the vector in the local coordinate space. Now we've got to change the direction in the world coordinate space. We've got to convert it back to the world coordinate space. So we say direction equals, and then we use this, but we remove the inverse. So this is taking the direction from, now we're taking the direction from the local coordinate space and converting it back into the world coordinate space. And so that should, I'm hoping, work. Let's see whether that works. Oh, there's a bug. Did I mean normalize? Oh, not normalized. There we go, okay. Okay, and I've got to actually set that vector now that I think about it. Where is that? Uh, I've got to initialize this to, let's have it moving at a right angle, so one, one, uh, sorry, 45 degrees. So that isn't a vector of length one, but it'll be normalized, so that, that'll be fine. We don't have to worry about, about choosing values that, that, um, that are exactly at up to one. And now, yes, it works. 
And if we collide with the, whoops, oh, okay, that collided with the invisible wall down the bottom. If I collide with the corner, see, so yeah, that's nice. Now it's colliding with the sides of the sides of the paddle much better. And hopefully, if I can actually coordinate it to so I'll collide with the corner of the paddle, come on. Yeah. Stop that. Oh, that way. There we go. Yeah, it works. So that's that's what wasn't working before. Um, so it's nice to have fixed that. Okay. Cool. Um, so. So that was just fixing up what we did last time. What I wanted to get onto today was uh, somebody somebody asked me in an email today how we could add scoring to our games because it was getting boring not having a, having a score. So I've decided to um, to add scoring to this game and show you how to do that. Um, in fact, first thing I want to add is actually a game over condition because when we hit this bottom wall, uh, we put that bottom wall down there so that when we hit it, we knew the game was over. Um, so let's, and we have something in our code to check on that, but we don't have, we're not doing anything with it yet. So we have, that was in ball move. Um, down here in ball move, we've said, if the thing we've hit was the bottom wall, we've got, it's game over. Um, so what I'm going to do when that happens is I'm going to make the ball inactive. I don't want to destroy the ball because I want to bring it back in case we play another game. Um, but I want to make it. I want to remove it from the game, so so that we stop the stop the game from playing. Um, so the first thing we do, if we make that inactive, then that's um, that's going to boom, the the ball has hit the wall, and now um, we can see down here in the hierarchy. Well, I can see down there in the hierarchy. It's weird. It's done that again. Oh, okay, I will um, down anyway in the hierarchy. The ball is now um, inactive, and if we click on the ball. Um, we can see that it's been turned it's been turned off up here and so it won't be doing anything in the world um, so that effectively ends the game but it doesn't give us any way to start it again but we'll uh, we'll worry about that later um, what I also did we also had up in create bricks I did um, we, were talk we showed you how to use the uh, an array to define the color of each um, each th each layer of bricks I also was using, um, I also added at the end a points value, which is another array, but we haven't actually used that at all. We've given, we put values in there, but we're not, we're not doing anything with them. Um, so I added some code down here. I put some comments in here so we understood what this is doing. And this is the kind of level of commenting that's useful. Um, I'm not commenting each line individually, but little blocks that to say what they're doing, um, it makes it clear that what this loop is doing is creating a brick putting it in a rectangle, setting its color. And what we want to do next is, is give it a points value. Um, so what I've got is the brick hit. We put a brick hit script on each, on each brick. So where's our brick? Our brick prefab is here. It has a brick hit script on it. Um, so that seemed like a sensible place to put the, uh, to store how many points the brick was worth. So what I have is a uh, field here on brick hit, which is an inter which is a value called points, and that'll keep track of how much how many points this brick is worth. So when this brick is hit, the player will be given that many points. Um, and since this is the this is the script that recognises when that hit happens, this is the sensible place to store that data. Um, it's a uh, yeah. So so when we do create our bricks, um, we'll get that brick hit component. Um, we know that our every, our brick hit fib, uh, sorry, sorry we know that our brick prefab has that component on it, so we can be sure that this will give us a non-null um, response. And then we just set that field, the points field, we set it to whatever the points value is for bricks in in that layer. So each layer has a different points value, and it comes from that array. So we can just do that. So now if we run that code, we create our bricks. We come here in bricks and open up the hierarchy, we can look at each brick individually and and it's not working. And it's not working because, what did I do wrong? Because I probably didn't save what I just did. Let's try saving this. Let's try that again. Create bricks. Yeah, so now uh, each, now each brick in the brick hit there's a points field, and this brick has been initial. Its points value has been initialized to 500, 
And if I went down through all these bricks, you'd find that some of them were initialized to 500, those ones, the purple ones are 200, the darker purple ones are 100, and the blue ones are 50, and so forth. So according to whatever the values were in the, um, in here, in this points value array, um, I've said 500, 200, 100, 50, 50, 50. Um, so that, so now we know how many points each brick is worth, but we're still not actually racking up our total, um, total number of points. So we need to add something to do that. Um, what we want to do is have somewhere, some single location that's scoring, that's keeping track of all the score, or well, keeping track of the player's score. Um, so as points are, are added, as the player does something that gives them points, <coughs> we need a scorekeeper who's keeping track of that. The easiest way to do that is to create an empty object in the world and call it the scorekeeper and add it, give it a script which, um, give it a script for keeping score. So we create an empty object, I'll call it the scorekeeper. It can just sit, doesn't really matter where that empty object sits in the world because we're not ever going to actually look at it. Um, and we're going to add a script to it. I'm going to, I've got a, my version there, but I'll add a, I'll add a new one. Um, so let's call that one final. And I'll create a new script. Uh, create JavaScript called scorekeeper. Right, so close that, let's open it again, because it's the old one. Okay, so the scorekeeper needs to keep track of how many points the player has. So it has a, it has a property, points, it's initially zero. That's easy. Um, so then we're going to have, then other, th other objects are going to be telling the scorekeeper to add points. So. Um, we could let them just manipulate the points, points property directly, but it's a bit neater if we actually um, have a function to do it. So I'm going to make a function, add points. Um, actually, let's call that score rather than points because that will get confusing otherwise. Um, let's call that score. Add, and we'll add a certain number of points to the score points. And that function is very simple. It just says score plus equals points. Um, and so other, whenever we add, whenever anything in the game wants to add points to the player, we can just uh, find the scorekeeper and, tell, and call this method add points on the scorekeeper. Um, and so now we go back over here and we add that scorekeeper method to our scorekeeper object, which, right, we'll keep track of the score. Now, when we hit all we need to do is find the scorekeeper and tell it how many points the brick is worth and add those points. Now in order to do that we need to have a variable which is which tells us what the scorekeeper is and because this script so now we have here a scorekeeper um, field um, now what we'd like to do is just grab this scorekeeper and put it in there but that doesn't work and the reason that doesn't work is because this is a prefab and you can't have objects referring to other objects when from a prefab. So you can't have a prefab referring to other objects, um, which is annoying. So what we've got to do, rather than, rather than uh, assigning it in the editor, what we've actually got to do is make the code assign it at startup. So we use our start event handler. When the, um, when the score key, when, sorry, when the brick is first created from the prefab, it sets the scorekeeper by finding the object called scorekeeper in the world and then finding the, the component of that, which is the scorekeeper script. Because what we want to do is find the scorekeeper script. That's the one that has the method in it, the, uh, the add points method in it. So we find this object using gameobject.find. We get the component of that uh, in order to get the scorekeeper. Now, um, I've in previous, in previous times when I've demonstrated this, I probably would have done this over several lines, but, um, and what we could say is, you know, um, I could do something like var sk equals that, 
and then I say scorekeeper equals sk dot get component. Right? So you can break it up into two steps like that. Um, but I mean, there's no real need to for, to keep that intermediate value. So we can just whoops, I keep doing that. Um, we can just go straight from we get the uh, we get the scorekeeper object, and then we call on that object we call get component. Um, and so we can chain together method calls like this. If, it, if the return value of, of um, find is an object, um, then we can immediately find, call another method on that object. And so we can chain, chain together things like this. Um, it really is up to you as to, um, to which way you do that. It, I mean, the code, either of these alternatives would do exactly the same thing. Um, initially, it's probably easier for you to, to write it over several lines so that you understand each step that's happening. But, uh, but as you get better with, uh, with programming, you find it easier to do more things in one line rather than break it up into all its individual steps. Um, just don't go to extremes and make your code. Again, it's about readability. Um, don't go to extremes and try to put all your code on one line um, because that probably will make it rather hard to read. Um, so we have our score, and we don't need to score, store that in scorekeeper anymore. We, in SK, we just store it in the scorekeeper, scorekeeper, scorekeeper with a capital K, scorekeeper variable. Okay, so our scorekeeper is now. This is going to be. So this is a reference to the scorekeeper script. The scorekeeper script has an add points method. So whenever we, uh, whenever we hit the, when the ball hits the brick. We find out how many points the brick was worth, which is our, in our points field, and we call the scorekeeper to add that many points. Cool. And so now we come up here, and let's keep an eye. Let's play the game. Make sure nothing is wrong. No good. If we look at our scorekeeper, initially, over here, initially our score is zero, um, but we'll find as we play that that value will go up. So now we have 50 points, now we have 100 points, and so forth. And so that works. 400 points, etc., etc. Now this is all very well if you're playing in the editor, but if you actually want to play in real life, you, uh, you want to have something on the screen telling you that rather than, um, rather than having to look at the editor to work out what your score is, because that would be really annoying. Um, so the next thing we want to do is actually put stuff on the screen. So this is, uh, so this, so, where am I going? Mm, my brain, brain freeze, just a thing. Okay, so um, putting overlay, um, so in a game there's, there's, st there's two standard things that are going on on the screen at the same time. You've got the view of the world, which in this case is the, um, the ball and bricks and stuff in the world, and then overlaid on top of that, you've got some information layer. Um, so you might have your score, or you might have health bar, or you might have various other aspects that are sort of sitting on top of that world. And even if you move the camera around, uh, that, that layer stays the same. Like it's like a heads up display. Um, the, the, it's always there in front of you, even as you're moving the camera around. Now Unity provides a way for you to do that. It, it has what's called a GUI layer, um, G-U-I. It stands for Graphical User Interface. Uh, and the GUI layer is what you put things like the score or the health bar or stuff on. And even as you move the camera around in the world, that GUI layer stays on top of that and will sh always show you that information. Um, so the way we put stuff on the GUI is through an event handler. Um, and so we have a, a on GUI event handler. And this event handler is, is called on every single frame and it redraws the GUI on every frame. Um, so if what we wanted to do was show what the score was, um, well actually let's just, let's just um, show the string score for the moment. Um, so there's, a, there's an object called GUI which is there, which you can look up in the, in the scripting reference to see how to create things. And it has um, some methods to create various things. The label method will, is, is the one you use to put string on the, uh, like to put text on the screen. Um, and what it takes is two arguments. One is a, a, a rectangle, which we'll call score rect, and the other is a string. And we'll just, for the time being, we'll put up the string score. We need to have a variable for the score rect. <coughs> uh, 
score rect and that variable is a rect rectangle. Now if I come back to my scorekeeper, hopefully that's if I save that, save, come back to my scorekeeper, yes, yes, no, no, what's going on? Scorekeeper. No, what did I just change? Oh, I changed the wrong script, that's why. Hmm. Okay, this doesn't belong in here. This belongs on the scorekeeper. That's what we wanted. Paste it over there. And we'll go back to where we were. Brick hit. Score rect doesn't belong there. Save. Score rect belongs here. So any object can have an on GUI method which will draw up um, draw up the GUI components for that, for that object. The scorekeeper is the thing that's keeping track of the score so it makes sense for it to be displaying the score um, as well. Okay, so now we go back to our code and there is our scorekeeper looking right and we look here, okay we have a rectangle. Now this is the coordinates um, for where, okay about our time, this is the coordinates for where that, that text is going to be displayed. Um, so if we put it at zero, zero, we also need to specify width and height for how big, uh, how big, on, how big on the screen do we want this to be. I'm just going to pick about 100, 100, uh, hello, 100 and 100. Um, this is in pixels, um, so it depends on how big the screen is. Uh, this is kind of annoying because when you scale, the, when you change the screen to different um, sizes, uh, you have to worry about how many pixels there are. I'll get on to how to do that in a second. Yes, I know I'm meeting with Guy. Um, so now, hopefully, hopefully it didn't work. Okay, where did I put it? Mm -hmm. Oh, there it was, actually. Uh, okay, so this is even more invisible than, than before. Right up here in the top left-hand corner, in a grey font on a white background, is the word score. Um, that is really useless. So the other, the next thing that we want to do, which is, um, is to show how to, uh, to change that, what we can do is call, is add what's called a GUI skin. So if we just put up the word, if we just use a, a GUI label, um, this will write in whatever the default font is and whatever default color and size um, that Unity normally uses. Um, that's obviously not useful in this case because it's white on a white background. Um, so we use a GUI skin in order to customize the, the thing. And the way we do it is again the GUI object has a skin field on it which we can set equal to whatever the skin we want to use. Um, and now in our code we have a skin field here which we need to make a GUI skin. If we come to create this will be as far as I get today. GUI skin. Um, this is how we set the, uh, the, the, all, the all the style parameters for our thing. Um, so we can set the font that we want. We can set uh, various properties of all the different kinds of GUI elements that we'll create. What we want to do is here under the normal, this is the color that it's using. We'll change that to black. And now hopefully when we play, oh whoops I forgot to tell it that that's the one we want to use. Let's just call that GUI skin and when we come back to our scorekeeper say scorekeeper use the GUI skin and you can't see it because it's there it is right up here in the corner there's the word score hooray we managed to put text on the screen right now um, that's why does it do that it's weird how it does it off the side of the screen? Um, so we'll get into next lecture into how exactly to put up, actually up the, the actual score rather than the word score and I'll show you how to pick a better font than that and resize it and stuff. I just want to go over in here what we just talked about. So, so most programs have some sort of graphical user interface and um, which is the way it displays input, uh, displays information and accepts input from a user. In a game, uh, the GUI usually, uh, usually refers to those, those informational elements that are overlaid on the world. 
Um, so the game, again, makes a distinction between what is the game world and what is the GUI. Um, in an application like Word or whatever, you know, it's all GUI. Um, the whole thing is the GUI in a sense. Um, and so the GUI is used, elements in a GUI will include sort of labels, which are text on the screen, might have buttons, might have scroll bars, might have you know, all manner, of, all, of, all the usual things that you're used to seeing in the GUI in the um, in programs that you use. Um, in Unity, we have a class called GUI, which is used for adding informational overlays to the game. And the nice thing about this is it adds it as a layer on top of the, the scene, and so we can move the camera around and the GUI stays the same on top. Um, if you follow this link to the uh, GUI scripting guide, it'll give you a lot more detail than what we're going to talk about uh, in, in today, today and in the next lecture. Um, but in particular, the thing that you want to do, GUI up, updating happens in this on GUI um, event handler. Um, so it's an event handler like any other, like the update one, it's called on every single frame. Um, and what it does is redraws the GUI on that frame. And you use, and the GUI class provides a bunch of, func uh, bunch of methods for drawing things. Um, we'll just look at labels and, and, and buttons in next week's class, but all the different controls that you would expect to have in, a, in an application are available to you to use there if you look at it. Um, GUI, all of the functions basically expect this kind of form. They have a rectangle for where the object's going to be displayed and a, and a label or, or some component. So if this was a button, the rectangle would be how big, where and how big it is. The label would be what the text is on it. If it's just a label, then it's just putting text on the screen in that space. Um, like I said, this is called on every frame and it redraws the entire GUI on every frame. So, um, so you can make things change simply by redrawing the GUI slightly differently. So if we wanted to have a, la a label on the screen which was telling us whether we were going up or down, then we could have our own GUI method say if, check whether we're going up, if we're going up, then we put, when we put the label up, otherwise we put the label down. And as, that, as that's called every frame, whenever go, going up changes, the, the GUI will change as well. Um, this is slightly different from GUIs in other languages, like if you have a programming in, in applications in Java or C Sharp, um, there you more set up all the components once and then just change their properties. Um, GUIs in, in, um, in Unity, you actually redraw them on every single frame. The important thing to know um, is that GUI coordinates are different from world coordinates. Uh, world coordinates have that X, Y, Z uh, axis. GUIs, first of all, are only X and Y. There's no depth. It's, it's just an X, Y position on the screen. It has no in or out of the screen. So there's no Z. Um, the second thing you need to know is that they're in pixel coordinates. Um, so 0, 0 is the top left corner of the screen. Um, and then every pixel further on is one, is one unit more. Um, so your average screen is like 12, is, you know, 1280 by whatever, I can't remember the numbers. Um, so the, so on, your, on your display, it won't be from 00, zero to 1280 and whatever this point is down here, I don't know, 9 something or 1000 and something, whatever it is. Um, if we want to get at these pixel sizes, um, because our game might be running on several different size screens, and this is annoying because if we want to put a label in the middle of the screen, we don't know where the middle of the screen is because we don't know how big, we don't know beforehand how big our screen is. Um, the camera has two properties which are really useful, um, pixel width and pixel height. So if you have a look at the, uh, the camera in your scene and ask it what pixel width and pixel height are, it'll tell you what the uh, current screen coordinates are, the, what the current screen size is. Um, so. Uh, camera, the camera class has a main property, which is whatever the, the identity of the main camera is. Um, so camera.main.pixelwidth tells us how wide the screen is. Uh, it looks at the main camera in the scene, and usually there's only one camera in any scene, um, and tells us how, many, how wide it is. If we divide by that by two, we get the middle of the screen. Um, so that if you want to stick something in the middle of the screen, you might do something like that. Um, we can, if we want to change the style, we can use a GUI skin. So it'll, it changes font, it changes color, it has some control over the layout, whether things are left or right, justified or centered or whatever. Um, the, we can create that using assets create GUI skin, like I showed you. And, um, and then to, to use it in our code, 
we <coughs> in the on GUI method, we have to set GUI.skin, so this property, to whatever the GUI skin is that we want to use. And the easiest way to do that is have a, have a property on our object which tells us what GUI skin we want to use. Now we can change that skin as many times as we want. So if you want to use different fonts all over the screen, then, uh, then we can set it, set it once here, then further down we can set it to a different skin to use a different font somewhere else, and a different skin, and a different skin, and a different skin. Usually it only makes sense to only use one skin because you want to have a sort of uniform look to your game. But if you really do want to have funny different fonts everywhere, um, in particular if you want to have different sized fonts, um, which I'll show you a bit more about how to do next time, um, Unity really only expects the font to be of one size and you have to re-import it again if you want to use the font at a different size, which can be really annoying. Um, so um, that's one way, do it, one way of doing it with several different GUI skins. Um, and we'll talk about GUI buttons next time. So that's all for today. So what's our, so, so in the next lecture, um, I'll show you how to actually put the, the score up on the screen We'll use a more interesting font than that as well. And, um, and then we'll add a high score list, uh, a game over condition and a high score list in order to track the best scores. And we'll let you play the game more than once because, you know, hey, that would be exciting, wouldn't it? Okay, thanks for coming. See you next week.